Thank you, Loring. Hi, everyone. Good morning. So in some ways, it feels very natural to do a panel about new ideas in New York at a conference about new ideas in New York. Um, but in another way, it feels sort of funny because I think New Yorkers, and I consider myself one of them, um, like to think of our city as the center of the universe. Um, and sometimes that can end up making us as parochial or blinkered as the places we may have left to come here. Um, I debated whether to include a joke here about main character energy and New York having main character <laughs> energy. <laughs> so we'll just I consider think he just this. Did. I think yeah. I just did. Yeah. Um, but our panelists have all found ways to push against the status quo of New York by creating models that haven't really existed before in this city, or at least not for a long time. Lonti Ebers in the field of private museums, Ebony Haynes in, the com in commercial galleries, and Dia Vige in public art. So before we get into it, I'm going to introduce them briefly. Uh, Lonti Ebers is a collector and the founder and CEO of Amant, an arts organization that hosts residencies and exhibitions that opened in Brooklyn in July 2021. She has served on the boards of several museums and is currently a trustee of New York's Museum of Modern Art, serves on the Board of Governors for the Center of Curatorial Studies at Bard College, and sits on the European Committee of Tate Modern in London. Diavige is the Associate Curator at Creative Time, where she commissions and stewards large-scale public artwork and initiates public programs. She has also worked at the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs and as a Curatorial Fellow at the Queens Museum. She currently serves on the boards of the Laundromat Project and A Blade of Grass. Ebony L. Haynes is a writer and curator from Toronto, Canada. She is a senior director at David Zwerner and leads the gallery's 52 Walker Space in Tribeca. She previously served as director of Bartos Gallery in New York and Shoot the Lobster in New York and Los Angeles. She also runs an online school that offers free professional practice classes to black students worldwide. So I want to start with asking each of you sort of, you know, one question about what you're doing and why. Um, and Lanti, starting with you, um, you sort of went against the grain by establishing a nonprofit arts organization that, unlike many institutions founder, founded by collectors here in New York, doesn't show anything in your own collection. Um, so why did you choose that model? Uh, well, I would say it was less choosing a model than rejecting a model. Uh, so. I was really not interested in the idea of um, a collection-based institution, primarily because in New York there are so many wonderful museums and also great private collections. I didn't think it was going to be additive to the cultural landscape. And listening to artists over the years, it um, was evident to me that the need was really um, to work with artists uh, from the ground up and that was really helping them um, have a place to work, um, have a community where they could um, slow down and think and uh, produce, produce exhibitions that may not be commercially um, uh, or in terms of its audience so popular um, and also have a space that was um, allowed performance which has always been the poor uh, cousin of the arts. So that was really the overall view. So I, I wasn't particularly looking at a model other than thinking and responding to what I thought were the needs. Hmm. And it's interesting because Ebony, I feel like 52 Walker <clears throat> has a bit of that you know, new model, but also rejecting other models spirit to it. Um, you know, it's a commercial space that operates sort of like a Kunsthalle. And, and you've said before that this is a model that you know, wouldn't be so unfamiliar maybe in Europe, but people in New York don't really know what to make of it. Um, so what is it that people kind of most frequently misunderstand about 52 Walker and what you're doing there? Um, first, just kudos to Lanti for opening something in the middle of a pandemic. Mm -hmm. I mean, I remember getting that email. I think it's really fabulous. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Second, I feel like I'm in a concert. It's like, come to the front. Why is everybody all up, up top? Um, I, I feel that um, one of the struggles I noticed having 52 Walker being in New York 
and this particular model that I've been longing to explore for many years, actually. It's, it's, it just shows how divisive the line is between institution and gallery. And there are reasons that line exists. And I, and I have never proposed a paradigm shift. I hope not everything turns around and um, throws those models to the side. But I think you know it's going to take a little time for some people to understand that it is a for sale space. The commercial aspect is very important to me to, to make sure that's at the fore. Um, but I don't represent artists. And I do commissioned work at the scale. I hope it feels like it's at the scale of an institution of a museum. And I think I'm just, you know, it gives some people in New York who've been in this industry with me and before me some time to kind of wrap their head around it. But I have time. And a couple of things you've said that I didn't necessarily know about it is that, you know, you don't do art fairs. Mm -hmm. and uh, not yet. Not yet. No don't absolutes. Yet. <laughs> <laughs> this is recorded. Maybe I end up in an art fair in five years. All right. For the moment, no Currently, art fairs. no art fairs. And that, you know, you're often working with other galleries that do represent these artists, and so sometimes you're working with them on consignment. I, can you talk just a little bit about sort of how the relationship works, both with galleries who represent the artists that you show and also with David Zwerner? Sure, yeah. I, um, you know, having been a director in galleries for over a decade in New York, I really appreciate the relationship of representing artists when you work in a gallery. And I really didn't want 52 Walker to feel like a beast coming in to swoop over and take over the relationship or remove the um, relationship that the artist and, and gallery have in trying to realize something that is exciting for the artist. Um, so just keeping in mind that 52 Walker and this gallery representing the artist both want something great for the artist. So it's meant to be a collaboration. Um, I, I involve them in all of the decisions. I keep everyone posted about production and release dates and photography and pricing and try and be very transparent. Um, just to kind of show again this different model, it doesn't have to mean that there's a big gallery coming to kind of take an artist away, but really to support what the gallery has already been doing with that artist and to kind of provide a new platform. And Dia, at Creative Time, you have been very deliberate about how your projects you know, speak to and welcome and keep safe a, a wide variety of New Yorkers. And so I wondered if you could talk a little bit about, you know, how you did that in the two projects that you've overseen recently, Red Stage in Astor Place and The Last Stand in Prospect Park. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I guess I'll, I'll start by saying for the past year at Creative Time, we've been running a think tank with nine artists, thinkers, academics, writers, to kind of rethink cultural practice and, and how we move towards equity, maybe even thinking through decolonial practices. And the, their collection of ideas just launched recently, and you can find it on our website. Um, and the kind of thesis that they put out is that the difference or the line between artistry and administration is tenuous, if not fictional. And I think that's a lot of how I think about my curatorial work, too, is that in addition to understanding, especially in public art, the relationship to site, to time, what we do is temporal, it comes and goes, so like why now? And who participates and, and how? It's also thinking through like the structures that hold it um, in terms of permitting, in terms of safety, in terms of like all of those, those aspects that really welcome people or hold people in space. So this June, this past June, um, we had a project with Rasheed Johnson called Red Stage that was in Astor Place, which is this kind of historic meeting ground for everything and especially for performance and protest. And it has a really long history of that. And the stage is alarm red. It has plants like a lot of Rashid's sculptures. So it's living um, and it really was intended to be an invitation at this moment of COVID it actually was exactly between two variants. So it felt like a little freer in that um, four week period. And it really was meant to be an invitation to artists broadly to perform again and publics to come together again. So for a lot of people, it was the first time they performed again in public space, but we were really intentional to think like, well, we don't wanna go back to a new normal or to unnormal or what we knew and how do we kind of hold this space of, of protest? How do we make it so that we can change some practices? And so we launched um, a one month long 
program that brought together artists, performers, poets, um, dancers, visual artists, there was painting classes, sound baths. We like really brought people together around this idea of like what's possible in that space of performance and protest. And there was, con there was talks on abolition, on housing justice, on um, interfaith organizing. There was a lot, there was a Stonewall protest takeover for Pride. It was really focused on like what is the public space we wanna build. And in doing so, we also consulted a lot of um, folks in queer nightlife. We had security present that was de, uh, that de-escalates, that uses the cops as an absolute last resort, that can administer Narcan on site. We thought about, well, what if houseless folks come through? We had food, we had water, we had PPP. We were like very much like, what, what is the public space we wanna see? And, and how do we put forth the politics um, to, to make sure that people are safe, that we're not just welcoming people, but we're making sure they're safe. Um, and it was really artist-led in a lot of ways. We gave over the stage to artists to kind of take over, and um, we programmed it for 150 hours, and outside of our time, it was open to the public to drop in and sign up and do whatever they wanted. So in that sense, we also took care of all the back end, the permitting that makes it difficult for people to just claim space like that. Um, and it was just this like amazing, temporary, but beautiful coming together. And really we, we called it a resurgence and that's, that's what it felt like. And of course, immediately after the next variant of COVID came and our capacity limits went back down, but we met this like perfect moment of that summer. Um, and then for the project that you mentioned, Kamala Shankaram, who's an opera maker, it's her first public artwork. It was in Prospect Park in fall of last year. Uh, and it was an opera for trees. It was a 10 hour experimental soundscape um, that made entirely from field recordings of one Northern Red Oak tree in Black Rock Forest upstate. And part of the um, impetus for her work was that she really wanted to make it for trees as a primary audience. So part of the composition was vibrational, which we knew also was like really important for our hard of hearing and deaf audiences. So we brought in an access consultant and really built that out, built out a really robust kind of access plan to it, included audio descriptions, had this vibrational component, um, haptic sound vests, um, and part of the, I think one of the most beautiful things about working on that project with her is she's an opera maker and is used to kind of a certain kind of storytelling, but when learning about how to tell a story of a tree, and we talked to a bunch of scientists and ecologists, it was, really clear there's no way to tell the story of one tree. It was always about the forest, it's always about the collective. And so that really came to be not just the project, but the, the space that we tried to create around it. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's interesting hearing you all talk because you are sort of catering to different slices of audience. You know, there is, there's in New York, the people who will just be walking by in Astor Place, there's the the sort of jet setting curator who might come in and want to see, you know, have an opportunity to see work by an artist that wouldn't have existed otherwise at Amant. And so, you know, obviously New York is both of these things, right? It's a, it's a extremely complex ecosystem in and of itself, and it is a hub for the international art world. Um, and so, you know, in your work, who do you see as your primary audience? And I'll start with Ebony for you on that. Um, I mean, is it too lame to say everybody? I mean, <laughs> I really, I hope that curator makes a stop to see the show, but I also hope that the tourists who are walking around Chinatown or Little Italy want to come over when they see that there's a free space to come and engage with art. Um, I hope that the longer time frame for the show supports a lot of visitors for that reason. You know, I hope it becomes, I, in my dream world, it would become a destination that's timed with people's visits from around the world who are coming in for art fairs or to see, you know, when they make a stop at a museum, they'll also make sure to catch a 52 Walker show. Um, interestingly, I've had recently, or we've had at the gallery, a lot of calls of people asking if there are tickets. Mm. And some galleries get that, and I have in my history as well, but it's been an, an ex, you know, a, a noticeably larger number of people asking that, which makes me feel like we're going in the right direction, that it feels like a destination or people aren't familiar with the fact that it is a commercial gallery and free. You know, it's just an interesting um, moment. It's still, it's still very new. It feels like it's been open for a long time, but we are just installing the third show because the shows are so long. 
Um, and I, I think the audience will continue to grow, or I hope it does. We also just launched a library for those who are not on the mailing list. So come and get a library card. Like I hope it, in, I hope it in, in encourages people to come in and engage, and there's places to sit if you want. You can also come and swoop in for three minutes. And you what's know. in the library? The library is built off of each exhibition, so any texts that I've referenced or shared or spoken about with the artists in building the show. Um, every show has been you know, in planning stages for at least a year in advance, so we have lots of time to talk and write and think. And then we put those items, um, it's linked to the exhibition, so you can use it as a reference, just kind of as an annotated bibliography for the exhibition, or you can actually come and take some books out. And you can take them home? You can take them home for four weeks. I was going to say, are there late fees? No late fees. <laughs> <laughs> no late fees, but, you know, honor system. If you don't bring a book back, then you can never get a library card again. <laughs> <laughs> and, Lanti, I'm curious about your thoughts on this because you, you do wear different hats. You're on the board of MoMA, you were previously on the board of the New Museum, and then you also operate your own space. And so I'm curious, you know, has the experience of, of opening your own space and you know, how has that been different from being on the boards of other New York museums in terms of how you approach the question of audience? How I approach the audience? In, in terms of how you think about audience. You know, in your work <clears throat> on boards, I imagine there's, there's one frame of thinking and then you know, for your own space, I imagine there's another. Well, my role is, is really very different. Um, I, I have a, a director um, at Elmont, so I'm um, really more involved in the overall um, view and vision of the institution. Um, in terms of audience, it's, it's clear that there are different audiences. You could say, although the audience for MoMA is, you know, um, huge. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, what we're developing are um, audience and serving an audience where we are. So it's really quite a nascent um, institution and uh, and so we're growing and we're learning how we can serve our public better all the time. And we, like Ebony at 52 Walker, really want to grow and draw an audience that comes from many different um, <clears throat> areas and fields. And that includes um, curators, international curators coming from wherever. It, it includes uh, artists. Um, of which there are many um, where we are in Brooklyn. Uh, so it's, it's not just uh, a single audience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because all three of you have sort of pursued these new projects during the pandemic. And there was this moment, I feel like, living in New York um, where in the middle of all of this, you know, terrible sadness and anxiety, there was also this sense that um, you know, things were possible that hadn't been possible before. Um, rents were really cheap. I just talked to a, a real estate agent who said that gallery rents went down around 30% during that time. And so people were able to take up spaces that they maybe wouldn't have before. There were tons of these open storefronts. And, you know, I feel like there was all this conversation about, you know, what's going to go in the open storefronts? Is it going to be some kind of art project? Um, and, and that lasted for a little while. And then I think, you know, rents started to go back up and things started to normalize. And there was this sort of glimmer of an opening that, that maybe has closed. And I wonder, you know, you all have established these new spaces, I think, during that period. And so I wonder, you know, how did that moment inform your work? And do you feel that that sense of openness remains now? I'm gonna give it to any of you. Ebony? <laughs> um, I think that, I'll speak for myself, of course. I, I definitely felt there was a window that opened where I had an opportunity to realize something that I'd been thinking about for a long time. I think it was part luck and part um, serendipity and you know, just all of the stars were aligning in this one moment. Um, for me to also have, I feel very privileged to have had the opportunity to partner with my partner of choice to do this. You know, like it all felt, um, 
you know, it was like there was, I was sitting in front of David Zwerner and I hadn't planned to propose this yet and it was like, I, I'm not, this is, this sounds kind of hokey, I'm about, I didn't plan this, but I, I wanna kind of get the sentiment out of this moment. It really felt like there was a window that just opened in that room. And I just kind of switched my gears and was like, this might be a time uh, to try and do something different together in the art world. And I don't think that moment has necessarily left us, um, but may just be harder to feel the window open. I think um, it's easier not to take risks. And in a time for me personally, again, I felt like I didn't have much to lose in my career. It's something I really, really wanted. And having gone through the pandemic made me realize even more that I couldn't, I couldn't continue in a model that I'd been working in just personally. But I hope that people feel excited and inspired to, to try and open their own windows, if you will. Do you think that, that in the same way that you were sort of felt this shift and seized that moment that on the receiving end, that Zwerner and that institution was more open and willing to experiment than maybe they would have been in a different point in time? I think that everybody was more open in that, in, in, for that whole year, really. I think everybody felt compelled to think a bit slower, to you know, um, provide more empathy and patience with things that were happening to them directly or you know, just in the world. It was hard to understand what everyone was going through. And this sound, this also, man, I should have practiced these answers. It sounds like I'm prepared, that I've prepared this, but I also feel like not every gallery would have been as open to this. And that may just be a testament to the history of David Warner Gallery and the programming. You know, like I didn't come in and say, I want to open another David Zwerner. This was like a proposal of something completely different. And I don't, I wonder, you know, maybe it would have gone differently with someone else, but I think I knew that it had to be the right kind of partnership. But I do think, you know, everybody was probably more open at that time. Yeah. And Dee, I'm curious about how, how that moment functioned for you too, because I do think, you know, a lot of the work that you've done at Creative Time is quite different than mm -hmm. what Creative Time has done in the past. Yeah, also my, my vantage point is different. Before Creative Time, I was working for the Department of Cultural Affairs, which is the biggest public funder of art in the country. Bigger but than the NEA. Bigger One than the NEA. Um, but it got me into every borough, every neighborhood. It really gave me a bird's eye understanding of the landscape of nonprofit arts in the city. And I'm, I think it's amazing that people who were able to seize on that opportunity did so with thinking about new models and thinking fresh for, about fresh ideas and, and kind of taking the call to work differently. Um, but at the same time, like one third of nonprofit arts organizations might not come back from this. Like in the first week, 100,000 artists applied to Artist Relief for $5,000 cash funding. Like it wasn't, and, and just seeing New Yorkers so reliant on uh, moratorium on evictions, um, seeing food lines kind of explode and artists take the call to participate in mutual aid and do more community work. Just, it was a real moment of survival, I think on the other end. And it, it kind of showed the discrepancy within the art world as well as the world of like those with resources and those without. And I think a lot of people in, in the nonprofit sector, a lot of artists got creative out of a need for survival and less so because rent was cheap or because they could take on these opportunities. I think for, from my vantage point, it really was a kind of um, those who, who have that privilege and, and sometimes use it really wisely by bringing in new people and new ideas, were able to do that, and others were really trying to survive. But I do think amazing things came out of that, that moment of survival in terms of um, institutions working together differently and resource sharing, um, in terms of artists supporting each other and communities. I, I, I think I would love, and I think we'll see that grow and grow, but I, I don't know that it felt like that for most people. Mm -hmm. And Lanti, I mean, opening Amant during the pandemic, I, this was a project that you'd planned long before. And yeah. so did, did that 
change anything about the project? Uh, well, we had um, been planning and, and designing and building uh, several years before. Probably the only thing that changed, uh, we were delayed, obviously, um, in, in uh, opening, but to me, it uh, just underscored the importance of uh, helping the artistic community. And I think that the um, pandemic really um, raised the possibility of a threat to our cultural vibrancy in the city. And uh, I think that really induced a lot of the collaborative work between institutions because they realized, hey, you know, we may not survive this. And so that was really meaningful, I think, um, that relationship that was built between institutions and organizations. And, and I think people recognize just how important the artistic and cultural community is to New York. Um, even when New York was sort of semi-vacant, it seemed, um, there was a real interest to find places to meet, convene, and engage um, in, in some cultural artistic activity. So um, I think New Yorkers thrive on that, and they need it. So I think, you know, if we learn something, we realize just how absolutely structurally important culture um, is to New York mm -hmm. and the life of New York. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I remember speaking to you about the, your residency program and the fact that, you know, that also gives in the same way as Artist Relief, like a glimmer of just how big the demand is too, that you, you know, you had applications open for a really short period of time and you were flooded, right? We, we were. We had, a, in the first year, we had eight openings and we had over 1,200 applications. So it was, it was uh, overwhelming. <clears throat> but I think it's, um, you know, now we're, we're trying to find a better way to manage it. But there, there are very large audiences in New York. I mean, it's something I hadn't realized before is um, somebody had once referred to Brooklyn and they said, <clears throat> you know, the neighborhood. It's actually not a neighborhood. It's, <laughs> It's, uh, you know, more than double the size of Manhattan, and it has a million more people. Um, it is a huge, um, um, you know, vibrant uh, city, really. Um, so there are many possibilities in New York, and <clears throat> I don't believe that, you know, the, what we have is enough. There are many um, other possibilities open for other people to do other projects. <clears throat> And you know, one of the things that we've referenced a bit here is also just the yeah the difficulty of of living in New York. And um, I looked up a very <laughs> depressing statistic, which is that rents in New York rose 33 percent between January 2021 and January 2022, and that's almost double the national rate and the highest increase among the 100 largest American cities. Um, and and that reality is not going anywhere at this point. And so I wonder, you know, like how much experimentation is really possible in a city this expensive? And, you know, how can it remain this kind of creative hub that we know that it is now if artists can't afford to stay here? Dia, do you wanna? Yeah, start? sure. Um, I will say that I think um, in creative time will be 50 next, in 2024. Um, and I think part of its ability to turn 50 is that we were able to secure our building for $1 with our office space um, in 2000 as part of a really long uh, effort of cultural organizing from the Fourth Street in the East Village that's kind of managed by Fourth Arts Block that was born from experimental theater in the area that took over spaces in the 70s. Um, and we're able to, through Loft Law, be in their buildings, maintaining them for low rent for 30 years before the city designated it a cultural district and gave all these buildings, gave all these organizations their buildings for a dollar. And that transformed the neighborhood. That's, if you look around the East Village, the people that have stayed are those that have those spaces. Um, and so I think when, when we talk about how to keep culture in New York, how to keep experimentation. It's really access to space permanently. It's really about through policy, through 
um, real estate developers, through industry, through all kinds of avenues, but it's really about access to space and removing that sense of precarity from mm -hmm. an organization and also from an artist for housing. And I'm not one to, I'm like low income, affordable housing for everyone, not specifically to artists is kind of my viewpoint, but especially making it easy for artists to apply to. It's like, the, that. that's like a, those are the structures we need in place to keep people <coughs> in place. Hmm. Do you have any thoughts on that? Um, I think that, you know, I, I mean, we're a commercial art gallery, right? This is capitalism. Um, there are the haves and haves not. And I think it's important to, you know, something that I really like to stress is if you have the means to extend a greater courtesy than is considered the norm, for gallerists in the room, I'm thinking, you know, maybe the commission split is different. Maybe the production costs get absorbed differently. Perhaps the artist is not the one who's paying for something out of pocket. You know, there are really small things that can be done that um, if you have the means to do it and are able to support a, a little, you know, make it a little even across the board with how much you have available to you as a resource as opposed to how much someone else has, um, I think that goes a long way, you know, I think I think it would have been very easy for David and I not to consign works from other galleries. Um, but it's important for both of us to show that it's, you know, we, we want to figure out a new model that helps support different people who are working with artists in a different way. I think it's every, if everyone remembered that they could extend themselves just a little bit more than they are, um, it would change a lot, especially for the art community. And yeah, I mean, I think, People will probably be curious to know if you can share, like, how does the commission split work, or how does the production work there? You know, in in looking at this as a model that people might emulate. It's actually, you know, it's pretty traditional. I would say, you know, um, I support production for the shows because, as I said, this is they are pretty large productions, and we plan for a year in advance. Um, but I recoup production which is why it's important to talk about it as a commercial space. Um, and this, the commission splits are the same. The artist would never make less than an artist should in a 50-50 in a relationship with the gallery. Um, but then we also, we consign from a gallery. So there's like whatever, you know, there's internal discussions of how those percentages should be split. And, um, but it's important to have very open and transparent conversations for me. It's important not to um, keep costs hidden and keep prices hidden. And Lanti, how does it work at Amat? Because I know that you also are commissioning. Sorry? How does it, how does it work at Amat? Because I know that sometimes you're also commissioning work um, or supporting. Uh, for know, exhibition, mm -hmm. but we, we don't sell anything. Right. We're not engaged in any commercial activity. But are you, so are you paying for production for? Uh, we, um, it, it depends. Uh, in this last uh, exhibition with Galaporis Kim, um, we um, did a, a co-production with, um, with uh, the institution um, that it was going to next. So we, it depends. Uh, for Gala, uh, sorry, for uh, Grata Columba, there was a film um, that uh, the Goethe Institute had already um, uh, granted some funds for in the production. But yes, we would um, pay for the production and then we would look for um, partners, perhaps, mm -hmm. if it can travel. But, mm -hmm. you know, we haven't been open that long, so it's hard to talk about. <laughs> about yeah, it. I've only had three consignments, so I don't know. Yeah, it's a, it's a short but, but fruitful track record. Um, and, you know, this sort of leads naturally to thinking and talking about the art market, you know, something that has changed a lot over the past three or four decades is the size and the, the global nature of the art market. And, you know, there was a recent report done by uh, Independent and Crozier that found that New York accounts for up to 90% of the total value of art transactions in the U.S. And, you know, that can have 
pros and cons for the vibrancy of, of cultural life in a city, as we've talked about in terms of, um, you know, just cost of living. Um, but I wonder how each of you sees it. Lonti, do you want to start? Uh, I think that's a good thing. I don't think it's a bad thing, actually. Uh, I think the nature of markets is that they're, they want to be centralized. Even uh, in the country, there are always market towns. People like to convene and um, to uh, you know trade and 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 deal. Uh, so I think that's uh, I think that's good. I think you could uh, maybe a, another question might be why hasn't it developed elsewhere? Um, mm -hmm. But I, I, in terms of New York, um, I I think it's a good thing. There's a, a lot to be said for having that concentration. Mm -hmm. People come here, they come here for the auctions, they come for um, uh, the art fairs, seeing galleries. Mm -hmm. I agree. Ebony, what do you think? I think <laughs> it's a good thing. I mean, I, I don't know if how many native New Yorkers are on this panel, but I mean, most of us came here for that very reason. Um, I've been asked often if I would have liked to open 52 Walker somewhere else. I'm like, absolutely not. This is the center of the universe. <laughs> um, uh, I do feel like it does a disservice to, you know, I'm also an educator and I just recently was, um, had, was lecturing at, at Yale MFA for the last year's graduating class. And I've noticed with that class and others that I've taught, New York becomes almost like a it's too absolute in terms of how much it controls the market because I feel like it disillusions a lot of people to what should happen once they are here. And that's not to say it can't, but I think it gets frustrating for some who see that this is the, the center of the market and the center of the art world. And it's not so transparent as to why it's the center unless you've been involved in making it the center. And to try and get in feels a little, feels very privileged to be a part of the center. Um, I'm just rambling, but I think it's a good thing also. Where else would I open this gallery? Nowhere. I don't know. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be as exciting, I think, for me. Yeah, I think I, I, pros and cons. I mean, I, I too love this city and its cultural vibrancy and agree that it's great to have concentrations, but I think that there is like a whole world out there and it does a lot in terms of in terms of all of the other things we're talking about, like rising rents, rising costs, not acknowledging the artists that have been here generationally that aren't necessarily part of an MFA market. Um, I think it, it, it's a pro and con for me about how we think about um, decentralization and centralization and what we might be missing by putting a spotlight on New York. And you know, you, just mentioned, you know, artists in previous generations, and I think it was interesting in, in speaking with you all, you know, in advance, there were references to sort of models of the past, models of the 60s and 70s that came up. And, you know, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what, you know, models or moments in New York you look to or draw inspiration from in your current work. Um, and maybe I'll start with you, Ebony. Models or moments I draw inspiration from. Um, can I just, I've just been reflecting on what you just said. Can I just add something yeah. to that? I think it's important, again, for people who have the means to like extend more. Um, I, am, I am happy that there's a concentrated market here, but I don't think that means things can't happen in other places. And, you know, there's a huge infrastructure for the arts in Canada where I'm from. So much so that, I, in my opinion, the commercial gallery market operates quite differently because it can, mm -hmm. where you're also from. Two Canadians <laughs> on the New York panel. <laughs> um, but I think I'd hope that it would encourage, I don't, I'm saying I don't think that a centralized market means that other things can't happen and other things can't be afforded to individuals. Um, but we just need those people to push outside of here. Mm -hmm. And your question was, inspirational moments. You know, recently I just answered a question about architecture. Um, and it took me a while to answer, but I didn't realize how inspirational or how much of a mark the Whitney Museum, when it was in the Breuer House, had on me. Um, 
and I had been re revisiting images from those institutions, from those exhibitions, um, even the Met at Breuer. There's something about that building and how, like, just like how to figure out how to activate this Bauhaus lobby with these weird lights and the fact that you're in a cement garden, but it doesn't feel like you're in this cold building or space filled with rocks. Um, I revisit that a lot. I don't really have a, an understanding as to why, but it really also informed a lot of the systems that I put into place at 52 Walker. Um, I remember, you know, like we have laminated floor maps. It's no QR codes, no iPads to do things. If you want to fill out an application, you have to write it on a piece of paper. There was something about, I think, my experience. I had just arrived in New York in 20, uh, 2011, and I was at that institution a lot, and it just really resonated with me. In terms of contemporary examples, I'd have to think of it longer. That's the first one that pops up. Yeah. Well, and, and the question of space is in architecture is interesting too because you, you know Amant is is you know you all call it a campus. It's a collection of buildings. Uh, I don't. You don't call it a campus. No, the architect does, the architect but I don't. Does. No. What do you call it? Um, <laughs> we we just call it a complex. Complex. Okay. It's too confusing. Uh, when the term campus was used, it was like people imagined that it was some educational institution. I, I, no, <laughs> it was uh, complex. complex. <laughs> but you, you, complex or campus, it's different from a kind of like temple to your, you know, to your vision and collection, like in some ways the one we're in right now. Um, and so, yeah, how did you think about designing a space that, that didn't feel like that? You know, was that something that you were looking for? Um, it, it was. It, it, we were really looking for a place where we could expand. Um, so that limited our options, obviously. Um, and we wanted to be able to um, do a new building uh, that, uh, you know, limited, of course, you know, limited or gave us opportunities, depending on how you look at it. And then we were able to uh, incorporate um, outdoor spaces, which we wanted to do. Um, so all of those things were important. Uh, and I, I really liked the idea of having the functions as um, segregated in a way, so that if there's a performance going on, there's an evening event, it can be quite independent of the studio building and also uh, it can function uh, separately from the gallery spaces. So it works very well. We, we had at one point early on um, in, in the plans uh, an effort to try and consolidate the functions and it just didn't work uh, very well. So uh, that was just um, fortuitous that we were able to uh, acquire uh, adjoining uh, lots, even if it was across the street, sort of. But anyway, it's created it sounds like its a own campus. Access. Sorry? <laughs> it sounds like a campus to me. Uh, <laughs> across the street. Yeah, it's no, true. I'm just kidding. Um, it's a narrow street. Yeah. yeah. They're not carrying books. And they're, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but in any event, that was really what we were. And, and I like the scale because uh, relative to our neighbors, we, we really don't stick out. I mean, our our biggest neighbor is the uh, self-storage unit um, to the west, which, as I say, is, is we always have a sunny day because it's a bright yellow and it reflects, <laughs> the light reflects. And, um, so it's, uh, I feel that we've kind of nestled in to the neighborhood. And were you looking at other models or examples, you know, when developing them up? Um, you're talking about architecturally or? Either, architecturally or conceptually. Not, not really. Um, I was thinking more about the function and how, how we would serve the functions. Um, but uh, I, I don't know. I, I actually like, if anything, I, I liked the idea of the humane scale, which is something that you might experience more in Europe than you would mm -hmm. in North America. Um, you know, because there's, they're always a short of space in their urban centers, and so they find ways of you know, claiming um, uh, open lots and things. So I like that. It's actually interesting because the architect did um, the Kupcha Gallery in Seoul, and part of that structure was actually an infill project also. Because you have this dense city hmm. and uh, a dense urban um, situation, and you learn to be resourceful. 
Anyway. Mm -hmm. yeah. And Dia, I mean, and you mentioned the, the sort of history of Astor Place, but I wonder if there are other reference points for you, you know, in New York history or elsewhere that you're thinking about in developing these sort of new approaches to public yeah. art. Yeah, I mean, all of our projects are site specific, so they're always kind of an excavation, interrogation, honoring of that architecture, that history, that place. But I think for me, I keep coming back to the 70s, um, maybe because I'm looking more at our origin story, but it's really remarkable to see on the heels of a lot of activism from the 60s and in the midst of a really severe fiscal crisis in New York City, that organizations were popping up left and right, artist space, performance space, creative time, like almost all of, the, like Studio Museum, El Museo del Barrio, uh, Queens Museum, Bronx Museum, from like bigger institutions to smaller artists run spaces or, or um, project spaces for contemporary artists, they were popping up like within, probably from like 1970 to 75, like just within that short period of time amidst all of these issues right like the city was near bankruptcy like and so I keep thinking about the audacity of all of these people to kind of know that these spaces were necessary to support our practice and, and artists and amongst all of those odds they they did it anyways um, and I'm I'm feeling uh, I'm feeling like there's a lot of conditions that are the same and also really different from that moment and I'm I'm excited and hopeful to see the audacity of more people like Ebony. And I was just going to say, I hope somebody things. uses that word to describe me. The audacity <laughs> is such a great way Good. to describe it. it yeah. is. I feel like I would, yeah, I'd love that. Let's, just, let's all aim for that. Um, well, and it's interesting too, because I, you know, there, the other thing that I think the three of you share is an interest in questioning the pace of New York. Um, you know, it's a, it's a reason that a lot of people don't like it here is because it's like, it's too fast, there's too much change, it's too, you know, frenetic. Um, and in various ways in all of your work, you've, you've tried to create systems that make us slow down. Um, whether it's, you know, extended runs of shows or, you know, a, a residency program where there isn't a deadline attached to what you need to produce. Um, or it's a, you know, a public art project that exists for weeks on end in a particular space. And so, you know, for each of you, I wonder if you could talk about why that idea of, of flexibility and slowness is, is important to you and important in your work. Um, I, uh, you mentioned in my biography that I was a director of Marto's Gallery and Shoot the Lobster, and I was for almost five years and it was wonderful, um, but it provided me a, a very unique opportunity to work within two models. So Shoot the Lobster was not representing artists. Martos we represented traditionally and did art fairs. Shoot the Lobster did art fairs if I found it was appropriate, but it, it became, Shoot the Lobster became a space of kind of experimentation and more one-off projects. But the problem I had being the director of three spaces, like I was programming all of these spaces, is by the time one opened, I was at an art fair the next week, and then I'd go to LA for the closing and turnaround of another, and then back to New York for an opening of another, and then another, two New York galleries opening in the same week, and then I, I felt like I was sending a lot of, thanks for the show, um, where should we send the work back? You know, like it was going so fast, and. I was so excited to see these shows up and felt selfishly as the curator, especially at Shoot the Lobster, to not have more time myself with these shows that I felt really invested in. And I just, um, I just, this is, 52 Walker is all a selfish project. <laughs> I wanna curate shows, but I don't wanna curate it in a museum. I want to be involved in commercial art markets and I want the shows to be up for a long time. Like that's really, I just wanted to blend these things together. It was really, it was really ex exhausting and sad to see the works come down so quickly. Our projects actually come and go pretty quickly. We have like a three to five week window normally of which mm -hmm. you can see something and, and that's um, an exciting challenge, thinking especially about like Rishi Johnson's Red Stage, like how do you create a public space in such a short amount of time and mm -hmm. offer like 
can it have a culture around it? Is that possible to do it? And I think with every project, it's such a question of like, how do we make the, make the public feel that this in itself is a space? But the work that leads up to it can be years and years and years, can be really in-depth research with an interdisciplinary group of people. And I think something we're thinking about more is how to make some of that public too, like how to make the kind of long and slowness of it public, because what the public gets is this quick and kind of spectacular moment of public art, which is amazing, but there's all the layers to engage with behind that also. It's so great though, because even be able, being able to provide more time for mm -hmm. projects, um, so like residency programs and lead, like time to lead up, it's very different than, for most gallery models, you know, I would argue that artists are lucky to have an, a year. Mm. You know, that's a privilege to prepare for a show. Yeah. So that's cool to have more time. Yeah. Why is it so short then? It's a great question. Well, <laughs> uh, temporality is something that Creative Time's always been committed to, which I actually, I appreciate. I think in the history of public art, we know permanent monuments. That has the longest standing run. And I think being able to come and go and kind of be these aberrations and public space and see what can be left behind from them is, is an exciting inquiry. Um, and then probably just logistically, it is really difficult to get permitting for longer, to staff a space, to run that space, to fund it. Um, yeah, and it depends on what the site is, but it's, right. yeah, it's a lot of different things. But I think the challenge is interesting. And Lassie, what about you? What do you, you know, I think it's so interesting that your residency programs, you know, they don't have a like a checklist of things you have to do at the end and to show that you, you know, spent no. your time well and you know it's it's sort of a different way of thinking about pace. Um, it it is because we didn't want to make it like an artist producing for an exhibition or having to produce a work. The idea was that they could come and think and explore and you know take advantage of course of being in New York and meeting um, you know, a range of uh, people, but uh, we really wanted to give them that time um, to think and s slow down, so to speak. And one of the things you said earlier that I thought was interesting was this idea that you know, there are more models, right? That there are, we haven't seen it all, there are other things that could be done. Um, are there, you know, in, in the nonprofit space, in the public art space, or even in the, the like, you know, government space too, and in the commercial gallery space, are there, do you have like blue sky models or like blue sky ideas that you think, you know, I'd love to see, if not me, I'd love to see someone do this, this crazy thing in New York? I, I'm doing it already. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I, I'm excited. This, uh, that's just to lighten the mood. I'm excited to, to like, you know, to hear about and learn about new models. I hope that, um, you know, there was this, Thelma Golden said something really great a few months ago in, in an art forum piece, and a similar question was posed. And she said, it's like, I can't wait to see the next person to open a museum. I mean, like, why can't somebody in this room open a museum? Um, like, I'm excited also to see what other people feel compelled to move forward with and get inspired to provide spaces or rethink spaces. I think you have to be driven by some um, kind of a, a personal drive and inspiration because when you're starting it, you really have no idea what you're doing and whether it'll succeed. You know, there's a, a risk of theoretically failure, right? So you, um, you have to be committed to it. Would you not say that, Ebony? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> um, and where else can you feel the possibility of failing if not New York? Right. <laughs> yes, if you can make it here, you can make it anywhere. Yeah, right. I so. don't even sleep thinking about it. <laughs> well, that seems like a perfect moment to shift oh, into Q&A, because we finally got to the, if you can make it here, you can make it anywhere. And now, you know, that was really the goal of the whole thing. Um, Obviously, New York really is 
the best place to live in America, especially if you're culturally and artistically inclined. But how can, is there a way that we can help um, our regional communities and kind of size cities in America grow their audience of appreciators? Um, can, is there anything we can do to help elevate the experience and knowledge and skills of the artists living in those communities? I'm just curious if anybody has an answer. Yeah. I think um, that goes back to kind of my proposal to just kind of think how, how much further, a little bit further you can extend yourself. Um, you know, for example, I hold an internship now f at 52 Walker for two interns who do not live in New York, specifically for that reason, to try and provide experience for people who are not just around or fulfilling a, a school requirement. Not that that's bad, but I have the lead time to be able to say every year I will want to open it up to someone who doesn't is living in the city. Um, and I think maybe finding ways to extend opportunities in our own, you know, galleries, museums, nonprofit spaces is important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh. Yeah. Anyone else have yeah. thoughts on that? We've been talking a lot about how we can travel our our shows and our commissions to other cities in like deep partnership with organizations on the ground in those cities and what, what we might be able to do in terms of programming together or creating larger networks of public art organizations that are invested in the same ideas nationally or globally. Um, not just the idea that we would then be helping these cities, but actually we probably have so much more to learn from, from other places. And, and that's like a model that we're exploring is the kind of network city model. I have to say I'm less, um informed on the regional side of things, actually. I think that the pandemic certainly expanded that, though. Mm -hmm. um, so many galleries, even commercial galleries, um, uh, created satellite uh, galleries, mm -hmm. and that really helped uh, expand it. But um, yeah, I don't think I have anything. Yeah. I also have to plug, I have to plug the New Art Dealers Alliance for anybody who's not a member or haven't heard of them. I'm super proud to be a part of it, and um, we spend hours talking about how to support galleries in this very conversation who are not in New York City, um, making sure other voices get heard and seen at things like fairs or talks. So be a member if you're not a member already. I have a uh, brief question for Ebony, right here. Um, right where? Oh yeah, right, right here. Hi. Yeah, hi. Um, so thank you, um, all of you, for your your wonderful insights. Um, so I'm just curious about something you said. You mentioned at 52 Walker, you um, don't have QR codes and you're just using pen and paper. Um, so I'm curious about your feelings about um, innovation and technology and the impact that has on the art world, especially kind of in relationship to this concept of new models, new ways of approaching art um, in the space. Um, so if you could just talk about your feelings on technology, on new models and how that kind of correlates to your approach to uh, 52 Walker. Sure, great. thanks for the question. Um, I love technology. I embrace it in my life every day. I love Bitcoin and NFTs. Love is a strong word. <laughs> but I, I, you know, because I'm, I'm kind of want to move away from it within this model doesn't mean I don't, rec like I recognize its significance and need for it in other places. And interestingly, I've created this space or I'm trying to create a place. We even have a typewriter. You know, we have a laminating machine, a typewriter. I love stamps. This is just my own nerdy Luddite experiment. Um, but the shows that I've, I've done and will do are, you know, time-based, lights and sound performance, um, very AV heavy. Um, there's not a single show that doesn't have some digital component, whether it's video or sound in it for the first year and a half. Um, so I think I, I'd like to work, I, I guess I equate working slower with less technology to kind of take the time to put the paper in the plastic sleeve and then put it in the binder. My staff loves me, by the way. <laughs> I'm like, scan it. 
three hole punch it, put it in the binder, date stamp it, put it on the shelf. You know, like, let me just scan it and put it in the file on this <laughs> external hard drive. Um, it's really just forcing office systems to slow down too and to not make it accessible. So I, I see the need for it in some, in some spaces and to make things easier and more accessible for different reasons in terms of technology, but I'm hoping that I can work a little differently. And that also is a testament to the three month shows. You know, I also don't put images of the exhibitions online until no sooner than the mid-mark, which means if you want to see the show, you have to come or perhaps see people posting it on social media. But I'm trying to encourage people to really come in and not just go to the website and scroll through images. Would you ever accept crypto for art? Um, I, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. You know, it's, I... I also had this, you know, all of my bosses in my career have, every single one of them has said to me, including David Zwerner, in, a, in jest, they've been like, oh, I get a sense you don't really like painting, you know, because of the shows that I put on speaking to, like, they're very kind of tech heavy. I love painting. I am very excited about my painting show in 2023. Um, but I think... It's another to this idea of, of changing things. It's like I'm not against technology, but I do want to create a different experience. You know, I'm not anti-painting at all, but perhaps my program presents something that is not seen in some of the galleries that are around me on a regular basis. So it's really just pushing more of the kind of what kind of model and experience do I want to create? Thank you. No problem. Got one over there. Hi there. Um, sorry, Ebony, I don't mean to pick on you. Okay. <laughs> but, um, you know, as we talk about the new New York and um, we have a new mayor who, uh, you know, is embracing crypto and, um, you know, I think he's taking salary in Bitcoin or something. Um, I wanted to find out how any of your organizations are um, embracing Web3, looking at recording or, you know, authenticating works on the blockchain. Um, and, uh, yeah, just curious, you know, if that's anything that, um, you, your organizations or your artists are looking at. Is that for anyone or? For, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, for anyone. Yes. I, I have, I'll, I'll jump in. I have artists who are, um, are actively making NF, or I've worked with artists and I'm working with artists who are very involved with NFTs and... Bitcoin. I have artists who are interested in exploring it and have worked with. Um, I mean, I, I think it's out there. I, I think it's something people are exploring, for sure. Didn't people just have a, sh a gallery show at Jack Hanley? Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, there's, that's, that's the great thing about who, like this panel and this discussion is I think there's room for all of those things and we have the privilege of deciding if we want to create room for it or not. Yeah, I've been learning like very 101 about the DAOs and, and how perhaps the decentralized, what does this stand for? Autonomous, Autonomous organization. <laughs> I'm like, I forgot all the letters already. <laughs> um, I, um, yeah, I'm just thinking, like, what does that mean for a cooperative? Like, what, is that, what could that look like for an artist cooperative or collective? Or It seems like a lot of the principles are the same. So I'm, I'm curious to know um, how that might inform artists working together in the future. Lanti, what about you? Any, any artists that you're working with who are related no, to Web3? I'm, I'm not. Uh, I'm not. I have to say, I don't I have... N I'm just not, uh, I think it's all bullshit, actually. But anyway, <laughs> leave it at that. Any other questions? Did we get it all? All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much.